that's yeah, okay. <sighs> Been joined by council members Williams, Vaca, who will be here, uh, Carlos, and Lance Lynn, and some others will be joining us. So good afternoon. The council is going to begin today by voting on the rezoning of 3 Livania Place in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn to allow for the development of a nonprofit supportive housing facility. Next, the council is going to vote on introduction 1722A, which I sponsored, which would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to providing notice to class two property owners about registration of rent stabilized units and housing affordability programs. Anything that we can do to improve the quality and availability of affordable housing options in the city is a move in the right direction. So I thank my colleagues for their support on this item and look forward to its vote. Uh, moving on, the council will also vote on intros 1528A and 1707A, both sponsored by Technology Committee Chair Jimmy Vaca, which would update the open data law and extend the time do it and the mayor's office of data Analy analytics have to submit their annual compliance plan. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, members of the council. And as we all know, New York City has an immense number of services and resources that it provides to its residents. And when people take advantage of these services, they're inevitably involved in the creation of data. This data is fundamental to the city's operations, and it is also important that people have access to the data. Access to government information ensures public institutions can be held accountable. In New York City, the importance um, of, of, of data revolves around the laws that we have in place concerning open data. In 2012, New York City became the first municipality in the country to mandate that all non-confidential government data be made available online. Since then, the city has made significant strides in publishing this data and making it readily available to the public. Yet, as agencies have become more experienced with the complexities of publication and technology advances, there is room to improve existing law, and intros 1528 and 1707 will do just that. 1528 requires the open data compliance plan, which is published by DOIT, to introduce, to include names of data sets provided in response to freedom of information law requests, which are not already included in the open data portal. <coughs> Intro 1707, which I introduced with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, is multifaceted and resulted from conversations with a number of stakeholders. Many provisions in this bill accommodate the internal processes of agencies, and a portion reflects current agency practice in coding it into law preventing any future administrations from making changes. This bill will also provide the opportunity for greater public feedback on technical aspects of open data publication, and it will require do it to publish specific information on the status of all public data sets. This will allow the council and the public to more easily evaluate the progress of open data and the city's compliance with open data laws. I want to thank Tech Committee Council Malika Jabali, Policy Analyst Patrick Mulville, Finance Analyst Sebastian Bacci, and my Legislative Director, Zach Heck, for all their work on these bills. And I want to thank the Open Data team for all their work in making sure that we make the open data laws more accessible and easy to use for all New Yorkers. Thank you. We've been joined by um, Judge Alita Van Bramer and Helen Rosenthal. Um, having received multiple reports in recent years of residents affected by waterborne illnesses from contaminated tanks, the council will be voting on intro 657A, sponsored by Councilmember Dan Gorodnik, which would codify in the administrative code the submission requirement that currently exists in the health code and require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to post documentation of annual inspections on its website and the city's open data portal. Department of Health and to Hygiene would also be required to provide guidance on its site to assist users in determining whether a building is required to have a water tank inspection and to post information on how to submit a complaint about a water tank or water from a water tank to the department. Councilmember Gorodnik uh, was able to join us, but we thank him for this legislation. 
And looking to build upon the initial goals of the Vision Zero program, the council will be voting on three items to enhance traffic safety around our city. Intro 1116A, sponsored by Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bramer, would codify the Vision Zero View Portal in the Administrative Code and require the Commissioner of Transportation to publish a map showing the approximate locations of motor vehicle related injuries and fatalities in the city in a manner that allows users to disaggregate crash data by year, month, and time and day of occurrence. Okay. Additionally, the bill would require the Commissioner to publish summaries of recent design improvements that the Department of Transportation has made to city streets for the purpose of enhancing motorist, passenger, cyclist, or pedestrian safety. Introduction 1257A, also sponsored by Majority Leader Van Bremer, would require the Department of Transportation to develop strategies for enhancing pedestrian and traffic safety near schools in the city and to provide a report on a biennial basis describing such strategies, including information on whether the safety strategies have been implemented and their implementation status. And finally, Introduction 1463A, sponsored by Transportation Committee Chair Idanis Rodriguez, which will require the city to establish an alert system to notify the public and media of hit and run incidents resulting in serious injury or fatality in order to assist in the identification of drivers responsible for these incidents. I would like to ask uh, Majority Leader Van Bramer and then the Chair of the Committee, Rodriguez, to speak on their bills. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and to our, our Transportation Chair, uh, Idanis Rodriguez uh, for our joint commitment to uh, Vision Zero. Um, uh, just a, a few words. Uh, in 2013, an eight-year-old boy, uh, Noshad Nahian, uh, was run over by a truck trying to cross the street to get to PS 152 in Woodside, Queens. He was holding the hand of his 11-year-old sister. Um, that school, uh, which uh, is right on Northern Boulevard in Woodside, uh, was known to be a pretty uh, scary intersection. Um, and uh, it's for that reason um, that we have to do everything we possibly can uh, to keep every child safe. So I'm uh, uh, proud of uh, uh, Intro 1116, which will allow uh, New Yorkers to look for themselves uh, on this public uh, view portal to see where crashes are happening, uh, what time of day they're happening, uh, and for the Department of Transportation to come up with strategies uh, to eliminate those crashes altogether. Uh, but Intro 1257, the Safe Routes to School Act, uh, really was uh, inspired by uh, that tragedy in our Woodside community. Uh, and this uh, Intro 1257 will require uh, DOT to identify uh, the 50 intersections uh, that are most dangerous, the 50 schools uh, that are most dangerous uh, with the highest propensity of crashes uh, and dangers to children and require them to come up with an action plan uh, to make those schools uh, safe for all children uh, and to publish that data so that there are no more tragedies uh, like that of Noshan Nahian. So uh, I want to thank the speaker and the transportation chair and all of my colleagues uh, for allowing us to pass these meaningful pieces of legislation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, with those bills that I had the opportunity to be prime and co-prime, we reach into 50 bills. This is something big for me since in my first day and I only could pass one resolution, the Arizona resolution. Not because we didn't have good ideas or bill, but because of the type of leadership that also we bring, we, you have brought to the council. For many council members, we have the support we need to make good bills in our city. A hit and run is an epidemic. We can eradicate it. Today we will be voting on intro 1463, James Paul Guerrero, which will require the city to create an alert system similar to Amber Alert to notify the public of hit and run crashes. This similar bill already is in place in Los Angeles, California, and today uh, Philadelphia is also discussing this similar bill. At the state level, my colleague, uh, Senator Alcantara and Assemblywoman De La Rosa, they are also moving and getting a lot of support to make similar bill at the state level. As you know, DJ Paul uh, uh, was a popular radio uh, DJ at Omega killed last December by the hit and run driver in Brooklyn as he was heading out from his job entertaining his Brooklyn audience. During the fiscal year 2016, a total of 44 
1,865 hit and runs were reported, and only 510 arrests were made. Out of 38 of these crashes, only 13 hit and run drivers were arrested, 14 arrests out of 22 hit and, hit and crashes resulting in fatal injuries were made during the same year. But this year hasn't been the exception. From January to September 2017, 42 hit and run resulting in critical injury were reported. From the data provided through the end of September, only 18 hit and runs arrested have been made. Using technology already available to us to make New Yorkers and other <coughs> visitors aware of hit and run crashes that resulted in severe physical harm or death will make all New Yorkers and everyone a resource for the NYPD in finding the suspects. Hit and run, again, is an epidemic that we must eradicate. Today we are also voting, as the speaker in my colleague, a majority leader already said, on two more bills where I'm also co-prime with Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bremer, which aim to strengthen Vision Zero goals. I thank my staff, Jose Luis and Stephanie Miliano, Jennifer Martinez in the Transportation Committee staff, Malak, Jonathan, and Emily. Hoy estamos aquí votando un proyecto de ley que hace más fuerte las leyes en Vision Zero, que crea un sistema de alerta cuando un chofer criminal e irresponsable se va de la escena después de golpear a una persona y sin proveer la atención llamando al 911 para que tenga atención médica. Gracias. Uh, intro 1675A, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, would codify the Department of Finance's Automated City Register Information System, Notice of Recorded Document Program, long enough name, uh, by requiring the DOF to establish and maintain a system that would allow individuals to register to receive notifications by email or text message whenever any document affecting an ownership interest in real property is recorded with the city register. Again, this is Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and she'll speak to the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, deed registration fraud is a serious crime with long-lasting impact on its victims. Because of an antiquated bureaucratic process, it's far too easy for a criminal to file a fraudulent deed transfer with the city. They can then use that fraudulent filing to take out a mortgage, or even move into an unoccupied property. What's more, this is a crime that is often targeted at the most vulnerable, senior citizens or those grieving for the loss of a loved one and juggling their estate paperwork. The stories of those who have been put through this ordeal, uh, are these stories are truly heartbreaking. It's time that the city does more to protect New Yorkers and their homes. And that's why I introduced Intro 1673 along with Council Member Ferris Copeland. Our bill requires the Department of Finance to automatically enroll homeowners in the very long program, Notice of Recorded Document System. The system alerts homeowners whenever any document concerning the title to their property is filed, allowing them to react immediately to any pro potentially fraudulent activity. Previously, the Department of Finance hardly let anyone know about this system and people had to opt in. Now, they will be automatically enrolled if they wanted to, they could opt out, but there's no reason for them to opt out. This way their property will truly be protected. You know, thousands have already opted in, but now tens of thousands of New Yorkers will be protected because they will no longer be vulnerable to a fraudulent filing. It puts the onus on us, the government, to protect homeowners. Thank you. Continuing our work to open democratic participation to all eligible voters, I'm sorry, eligible residents, the council will vote on intro 508A sponsored by government's operations chair Ben Kalos, which would require the campaign finance board to create a website and mobile application that allows individuals to complete voter registration forms online. Uh, council member Kalos is the sponsor and will speak to the bill. Thank you, uh, speaker. It seems like every election in New York City hits a new low for voter turnout. 
Uh, earlier this month, just 21.7% of eligible voters cast a ballot, leaving the city near the bottom of the national list for voter turnout. Yeah. Uh, adding to this horrible turnout number is that only about 25% of eligible voters are uh, not even registered according to the 2017 Pew Charitable Trust survey. It's time for democracy in New York City to join the 20th century, now that we're in the 21st century, uh, and join 36 other states and the District of Columbia with online voter registration. Uh, this would allow New York City residents to register to vote on their phone. Uh, they could do it and sign with their finger, with a stylus, even a picture of their signature. Additionally, there would be an API so that third-party apps could allow folks to register on Facebook, on uh, Uber, Seamless. I would just love for folks who are using a lot more apps than are actually participating in democracy to get registered by those third parties. All of this is made possible because of an opinion written by New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman that said that uh, uh, counties and municipalities like ours could uh, set up online voter registration systems so that, uh, and then electronically affix a signature to the uh, voter registration form and then deliver it to the Board of Elections. I wanna thank the uh, speaker for all of her support in making this happen, as well as a uh, great team and staff, our committee counsel, Brad Reeb, uh, who incidentally scheduled a trip to England around this passage. Uh, committee, <laughs> committee analyst, Elizabeth Pronk, uh, finance analyst, Zach Harris, and my legislative director, uh, Paul Rector. Uh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Rabbi Carlos Mencheca. Uh, in an intimate relationship, both partners should feel safe in the knowledge that sexual photos or videos they may have shared with each other will never be made public without their consent. Unfortunately, as the technology to easily share photographs and videos expands, we are hearing more and more stories of people maliciously distributing intimate photos or videos as a means of punishing a current or former partner. This is commonly referred to as revenge porn, and unfortunately, it is entirely legal under state and federal law. Here in New York City, we are proud to be taking a stand on this widespread and abhorrent practice. Introduction 1267A, sponsored by Councilmember Rory Lansman, would prohibit the non-consensual distribution of sexually explicit videos or images, commonly known as revenge porn, of another person with the intent to cause harm to the individual depicted in such videos or images. The bill would also prohibit any legitimate threats to do so and create both a criminal penalty and a civil cause of action. Uh, after hearing countless stories of individuals being personally affected by the vengeful behavior of ex-partners, um, I welcome today's vote and invite Councilmember Lansman and thank him uh, so he can speak on this essential matter. Thank you, <coughs> Madam Speaker. Um, intro 1267 creates criminal and civil penalties for the non-consensual distribution of sexually explicit images, commonly known as revenge porn. This is the kind of legislation that shouldn't be necessary, but unfortunately it is. More and more women, and occasionally men, have had their most private photos and videos shared publicly without their consent in an attempt to traumatize, humiliate, or punish them. Indeed, domestic abusers are increasingly using the threat of sharing such images to coerce and manipulate victims to stay in a dangerous relationship, to cede custody of shared children, or as yet another means to shame and terrorize their partners. And as domestic violence offenses have risen in New York City, this bill is another way to protect victims from real and long-lasting harm. The bill allows prosecutors to criminally punish those who intend to cause harm by sharing or threatening to share intimate images with up to a year in prison. Civil courts will also be able to award damages, monetary damages, prevent uh, uh, images from being posted or order them to be taken down, and force offenders to pay victims' attorneys' fees. Today's vote sets the stage for New York City to become one of the largest jurisdictions in the country to criminalize revenge porn. Over the course of this process, we have worked with victims and their advocates, district attorney's offices, the NYPD, and private attorneys 
to tell any perpetrator who thought that they could get away with this kind of despis despicable conduct, not in New York City. I want to thank the uh, chair of the Public Safety Committee, uh, Vanessa Gibson, as well as the, the speaker, um, and in particular staff members Brian Crow and Deepa uh, Ambakar, who worked so hard on this legislation. Uh, as we move closer to our goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions in New York City 80% by 2050, the Council will be voting on Introduction 1637A, sponsored by Council Member Corey Johnson, which would create a long-term energy plan in 2019 and every four years thereafter and establish a City Energy Policy Advisory Committee, I'm sorry, Subcommittee of the City's Sustainability Advisory Board. We thank Council Member Johnson for that legislation. City employees and contractors interact with millions of residents each year from providing services and benefits to processing professional licenses. New Yorkers give their information to the city with the expectation that it will be kept confidential and only used for their benefit. While the vast amount of information in the city, I'm sorry, with the, while the vast amount of information the city uses can help in providing better and more efficient services, it can also create serious potential for misuse including improper disclosures and le needless collection or retention. First announced during my State of the City Address in 2017, the following legislative items would go far in placing safeguards on the information collected and disclosed by city agencies. Intro 1557A, which I sponsored, would require every city agency to report on their data collection, retention, and disclosure policies and current practices. It would also establish a chief privacy officer an interagency committee uh, charged with review those, to review those reports and developing new and detailed protocols for protecting identifying information. Intro 1588A, sponsored by myself and Council Member Jamani Williams, would require city employees and contractors to protect all identifying information, including contact information, sexual orientation, religion, and immigration status, by limiting its collection, disclosure, and retention, except where required by law. Requests for the collection or disclosure of identifying information would be processed by a newly established privacy officer within each agency who would analyze whether the collection or disclosure would further the purpose or mission of the agency. Related to our mission to protect New Yorkers as they seek city services, the Council will be voting on Intro 1579A, sponsored by myself and Council Member Carlos Menchaca, which would restrict access to non-public areas of city property as well as locations where human services contractors provide services unless the purpose of the access meets certain criteria. Taken together, these three bills represent an excellent opportunity to further ensure the safety and protection of our residents and their information. So I wanna thank my fellow council members for their collaboration on these items. I'm gonna invite them up to say a few words. We'll start with our council member Menchaca and then council member Williams. Thank you, Speaker and Councilmember Williams and the entire uh, City Council. We are lifting up a lot of values that we talk a lot about in keeping all New Yorkers safe. When our communities uh, are feeling safe, they create better um, access, we create better access to services. Intro 1579A allows that to happen to uphold public safety. Um, this will benefit all New Yorkers, no matter their race, religion, gender identity, nationality, or immigrant status. Um, this local law, particularly 1579A, allows, um, addresses safety and privacy concerns which may deter New Yorkers from seeking city services on property, on city property. It restricts non-local law enforcement access to these non-public non areas of city property. The protection of these non-public areas of city property will create a greater incentive for families, um, immigrants, and every New Yorker to access the basic benefits, um, to report crimes in their communities, and to preserve their health and well-being. And in a time that we're living in right now, we need to make sure that we're sending every strong message as a municipality to every everyone, and in every language. We will preserve public safety and protect the New York City residents from uh, non-local law enforcement when they are interacting with city government. Um, I'll speak more on the floor about this law, um, but I wanna thank everyone uh, on the team and central staff that helped make this happen and all the negotiations with the administration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Councilman Machaca for leadership uh, on these issues. And I wanna uh, thank my colleague, Councilman Machaga, for, for framing this as a public safety issue as well. That is important uh, when um, 
community, residents, citizens, anyone, when if people who are living someplace don't trust government or government agencies, uh, we are very much unsafe. And unfortunately, we're in a time now where people are feeling distrustful uh, of what government is going to do. Um, that is pervasive uh, throughout the country, I believe. And uh, New York City has, uh, I think, the responsibility to lead on how to deal with that fear. And so I'm proud to be part of this package. Uh, my uh, bill in particular is a bill which ensures that the collection, disclosure, and retention of all identifying information will not be allowed unless it's further the mission of an agency or it's required by law and creates the positions of privacy officers to analyze uh, whether the collection or disclosure meets the new standards set forth in the law in uh, all of the agencies. Uh, to put it bluntly, if we don't need it, we will not ask for it. If we don't need it, we won't ask for it. Uh, particularly uh, uh, issues of your address, race, religion, employer, uh, those are some of the categories, just to name a few, that people are afraid uh, to share uh, for various reasons. I'm just proud that, again, New York City is leading in this way, and hopefully, as it happens very often, when New York City goes, the rest of the nation goes as well. Uh, I want to thank again the speaker, Councilman Menchaca, uh, Kelly Taylor, and all the central staff, and my legislative director, Michael Kinney. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for something else, and if there's nothing else, I'll say a few words in Spanish. Hoy el Consejo comenzará votando sobre múltiples artículos de uso de la, de, de la tierra, incluyendo la resonificación de tres Levonia Avenue en Brooklyn para permitir el desarrollo de viviendas de apoyo sin fines de lucro. Después el Consejo votará para actualizar y extender los protocolos de cumplimiento de datos abiertos para las agencias de la ciudad y notificará a los propietarios de clase 2 sobre los programas de asequibilidad de vivienda y los requisitos para el registro de la estabilización de alquileres. Eh, el, el Consejo también eh, votará para exigir que se informe sobre ciertos elementos de las colisiones de vehículos motorizados, el desarrollo de estrategias para mejorar la seguridad vial cerca de las escuelas y la creación de un sistema para alertar sobre incidentes de choque y fuga. Y finalmente el Consejo votará para prohibir la distribución no consensual de medios sexuales explícitos, comúnmente conocidos como pornografía de venganza, y para establecer un sitio web y una aplicación móvil para facilitar el registro de votantes eh, por el Internet. Y that's it. I will take any questions. Uh, as I continue to say with regards to right to know, we are actively in conversations with the sponsors of the bill, with the administration, with the NYPD, uh, and even the advocates. So they, those are ongoing and that has been uh, happening for some time. So uh, we're discussing them and going through that process. On the issue of horse carriages, that time has come and gone for us in this session at least. We had an opportunity to engage, and again, this is an issue that I've been very supportive of. I uh, had a lot of engaged conversations with my colleagues. Uh, we got to a point where I thought we would be able to move it forward. We didn't. And at this point, there's no plan to do anything. There's been absolutely no request from any of my colleagues uh, to add either, you know, to move this, uh, move this bill. So we have uh, moved on. I have, look, there's been mismanagement of NYCHA for many, many years uh, that preceded the current chair. Uh, and I believe that she is uh, working diligently to address uh, some of that mismanagement and get NYCHA on the right path, considering the incredible challenges that it has uh, with the mismanagement, but also with the lack of access to proper funding for the institution. Now, with regards to what's happening, obviously the, everybody deserves to live in safe uh, conditions. And when it comes to the t hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that live in public housing, uh, they deserve that. So what has happened with regards to the reporting and the information provided, uh, it w that's quite uh, not acceptable, obviously, and it's uh, a problem. I have faith in Shola, I'll tell you, yes.
I cannot speak specifically to that. What I can say based on my experience, uh, having had two terms under a prior administration, which was completely you know, opposed to any sort of t discussion about reforms and changes, that we've come a long way. There have been s improvements, there have been reforms, uh, there has been a whole sea change in terms of the view of policing. And again, this is a, a bureaucracy and a culture that exists, which has to be uprooted. But there have been steps that have been taken uh, to try to take policing in a different direction from what I experienced in the two terms under Commissioner Kelly, where again, there was no willingness to engage in any conversation. So we have made strides and obviously not far enough, but I'm proud of the work that this council has done to shift the conversation, you know, to make sure that we are on a path of progress um, and that I can, I can safely say some may have uh, you know, issues with that, but I believe there has been progress made and I was very vocal and challenged Commissioner Kelly consistently on the policies and practices of the NYPD and I believe that we're uh, in a different direction. Obviously we're having conversations about additional reforms as we speak and uh, laws that we've passed in this council, the CJRA for example, uh, the NCO program uh, which we have pushed for and obviously the uh, hiring of additional officers allows that program to grow and to uh, take hold the investments in cure violence program, the expansion of the number of slots of you know summer youth, all of that stuff combined um, is really leading us in a different direction from what I experienced in my two terms under uh, under Commissioner Kelly's lead of the NYPD. If you're asking for the information, of course. That's, uh, that's, a, that's uh, something that is expected. Codifying it into law doesn't make it any less real. The, the officers are to identify themselves and they should. So I'm not contesting that in any which way. And I think that uh, that may be happening in some cases and I'm sure it's not happening in all cases. Yes. Yes. But I think I think we're already there, right? We have we, we've been having conversations with the administration, obviously based on the recommendations of the commission's report, and us and me supporting it very strongly. I don't believe ten years is the right timeline. I, there's ways of of moving that timeline to make it a shorter timeline, particularly by citing, you know, and, and opening for identifying where community facilities should be, starting the land use process, making sure we're committing capital dollars towards that. But we have sites, the Queens House of Detention, we have the Brooklyn um, facility down in, in, the, in that area is already there in existence, whether it has to be expanded or renovated. Um, around the courthouse in the Bronx, there's property that could be found uh, to house a facility. And we have here in Manhattan as well. So there's sites that currently exist, which all we, what we would have to do is look at how can we create a modern day facility that really addresses some of the concerns that were raised and the recommendations made in the independent commission report. So I think we're already on a path there. And the, the members in which those facilities are located have already said, and this is, goes back a while, it goes back uh, quite a few months at this point where it was even uh, put on, it, in an, it was uh, documented in an article in the New York Times that those members have clearly said, we welcome these facilities and we would be more than happy to support them. So we are, we're already on a path. There's, you know, we have to be more diligent and uh, some of the responsibility obviously lies with the administration to work with us hand in hand to make that happen. There's other things that we can, there's things in the report in terms of the commission's recommendations that we've already acted on. Um, in terms of legislation that we put forward, we want to give a, a, maybe an update, right, as to the recommendations of the commission, how are, where are we at with it. There is some, I think, uh, w whether today or yesterday, that the administration is putting out an RFP that has to do with the siting of facilities. Uh, there's stuff to talk about, right? There's other recommendations and uh, action items that have to be taken, action that has to be taken, uh, and we can't do it alone. So it's a matter of fi figuring out where do we stand, what's next to do, how quickly can we get it done. I 
mean, that's been the practice uh, going back to when I came into office. You know, I uh, believe that when it comes to items in my district and the nuances of my district, the organizations that are working in my community, what the issues are and that are relevant in my community, that I'm the best to be able to speak and know and understand those issues. Uh, and that is what I do is expect that deference and that understanding that I have the knowledge of my district. I was elected to represent my district and I give and defer the same respect on to my colleagues. Uh, so that's what we do is we engage and we have a great land use division that provides support and resources and technical assistance to council members as they deliberate on their land use items. Uh, we have council members that do become interested and concerned about items that may be in adjoining districts and engage in the conversation as well. Uh, but the deferring to local members is the way that, I, I, that we have operated here and I don't believe that, um, I believe that that's, that's a good approach generally. Now it's not always 100% as nothing should be 100% but generally that's the way we work as a collegial body. Those items that are obviously broader like when we discussed MIH which had citywide implications uh, that took a lot of work but obviously that was something that it was a citywide uh, decision, land use matter that, and zoning matter that applied citywide. So we all were engaged in that conversation. We didn't defer, we would defer to each and every one. And to your point earlier about yeah. what made it appropriate to engage with the council member as opposed to the other council member. We engaged with the council member, a lot of conversation. We had hearings, we had the developers present their case. We had a lot of conversation, uh, very involved conversation. And we are at a good place where we're gonna be able to vote on that land use item today. Conversations with the dis with the developers, conversations with the council member, having land use be supported to the council member, having council members be interested in the issue. It was a debate and a discussion, and we are arriving at a place where we're moving that project forward. Okay, thank, thank you. you. You know, I'm really proud of, of the progress that we've made as a council uh, under my leadership, thanks to the support of my member, of the colleagues. Um, we've made a lot of reforms in this council. I would definitely like to see the progress that we've made remain and move forward and even take them a little further. So my interest is that the next council speaker uh, is committed to making sure that we continue to implement the reforms we have in place and to move forward and expand them a little further. I'm interested in seeing that in the candidates and I'm not sure every single candidate is, is committed to those issues. So obviously when the field starts narrowing down, maybe I'll have a different point of view. Thank you.